The Universal Serial Bus, or USB, as it's more commonly known, is a standardized port developed to connect a wide variety of accessories and peripherals and other devices like mice and printers and monitors and music players to personal computers. The USB standard was released in 1996, and I'm old enough to remember a time when USBs were new and most desktop computers still had a crazy assortment of ports and docks and little holes that were unlabeled into which you were supposed to plug who knows what, which in turn required computer owners to learn what the dictionary of obscure symbols that labeled these ports meant, while also acquiring a collection of exotic single-purpose cables so they could connect their inputs and accessories to their cord-laden central computer tower. So rather than further dooming computer users to forever own a drawer full of cables, one for each of their devices, which only worked with that specific device type, and which could only plug into that precisely shaped hole on the back of their desktop tower, a group of seven companies, Compaq, DEC, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, NEC, and Nortel, came together in 1994 to develop one connector and connector standard to rule them all, something that would work across all their devices and computers, and something that would allow for the transfer of both data and power between devices. This would also, it was hoped, simplify the production of hardware, since they wouldn't need so many ports and could therefore mass-produce USB components. And this would potentially make their products more accessible, since you wouldn't need to dig through your computer's manual to figure out which of the 20 cables you received with it would allow you to connect the keyboard to your machine. The original 1.0 version of the USB, which came out in 1996, allowed for 1.5 megabits per second at what was defined as the low speed threshold, and 12 megabits per second at the full speed threshold. This meant that device makers could build USB components and cables meant to take advantage of that lower and relatively low-powered threshold, like joysticks and other controllers, or optimize for the full speed end of the spectrum when building components like disk drives, which would benefit from the additional bandwidth. The USB port was fairly flexible in that way. Later versions of the USB standard, which is managed by a nonprofit called the USB Implementers Forum continued to increase the speed available through the USB ports and cables and to increase their utility and variety of use cases for which they could be applied. In the years since initial development, the USB standard increased from the early maximum of 12 megabits per second to today's maximum of about 5 gigabits per second. And since there are 1,000 megabits in a gigabit, that means today's USB cables are capable of sending data about 417 times faster than those original model USBs, at least at the high end of their data transfer capabilities. That higher throughput has upped the range of use cases for this standard, making it competitive with other high-speed standards that have emerged over the years. But USB has also remained relevant by keeping its actual connectors, the heads of the cables, flexible and varied. Chances are, for instance, that your phone, if you don't have an iPhone at least, has a USB micro head, and that at least one or two devices you own have a USB mini head. The former is a bit skinnier than the latter, but both were developed with smaller devices in mind. These port shapes, the different sized heads, are different from the speed standards that are developed by the USB managing organization. The mini and micro and the different types of standard port like the traditional type A and type B, which is the rectangular shape of the original USB and the squarish 
power transfer focused USB plug that's found on many printers and other devices to power them on, mostly. These are both still found all over the place to this day, in part because they were so widely adopted, and in part because the newer USB connectors are back compatible with the older original heads. The older devices won't be able to achieve the same speeds as the newer ones, but they can still work together at the speeds made possible by the lowest tech, lowest quality, oldest version of the USB standard that's involved. More recently, the USB Type-C was released, which was a wildly different shape from most of the other USBs in the world, so it is not back compatible in exactly the same way. That non-compatibility led to a bit of a hubbub when Apple decided to replace all of their ports on their newest laptop models with only Type-C USB ports. Now, the capabilities allowed by these high-end Type-C USB ports are arguably worth the change. They can replace essentially every other port ever made, allowing for very high transfer rates and the simultaneous transfer of power and data in both directions, which is pretty cool. These laptops no longer have plugs for separate power bricks, as the AC adapter can just plug right into any of these USB ports. But the changeup was still quite a pain for many people, myself included, as I'm using one of those newer MacBook Pro models with the four USB-C ports and nothing else right now. It was a pain because it required many customers to purchase little adapters for all of their devices, which would allow all of their older USB-A devices and cables to work with their new computers. So the USB standards all still worked well together. The devices still interact as they should, but the heads on all of the cables are now having to change. They're needing to be adapted to allow for the use of this new superior USB standard, which is not yet common enough to be the dominant connector type that is included with most devices when you purchase them. Interestingly, Apple's iMac which was a boldly colorful, plasticky, playful-looking consumer-grade computer, spearheaded by Steve Jobs, a computer that helped the company recover from a period of catastrophically horrible sales and reputation in the mid-90s. It was the first computer to do away with all other non-USB ports. It got rid of that tangle of other cables that I mentioned earlier and replaced them with the newfangled at the time, USB-A ports. This cleaned up the silhouette of the machine significantly, but also pushed the issue as to whether this standard would be accepted. It gave other computer makers confidence to build USB ports into their devices, as they saw that the public liked the simplicity of the USB port, and they bought a lot of iMacs accordingly. Apple has pulled the same stunt several more times in the years since, and though their support of the Firewire standard didn't have the same outcome as their early iMac and USB port experiment, their more recent removal of all ports except for the USB Type-Cs on their laptops, and their decision to remove the headphone jack from their newer iPhones, does seem to have pushed these two facets of the tech industry toward making the same adjustments more broadly. We'll see whether what happens as a consequence ends up being universally beneficial in the end, but I think most of us, even those of us who are annoyed by these decisions and how they force us to buy a bunch of little adapters and change how we use all of our non-Apple technologies, even we can see that there's probably a good reason for these changes down the line. They help the hardware evolve and allow data and power transfer to become more convenient and speedy in the future. We're kind of at an in-between moment when it comes to USB ports today. I've got little dongles and plugs that allow me to use my USB micro cables for my USB Type-C plug-in needs and others that allow me to convert my USB mini cable into a USB Type-C. The specs all work across the board though the speeds with the older cables will be sluggish compared to the newer ones that contain the most modern technology. 
The interoperability is nice, even if, presumably, at some point we will replace all of these cables, from type A to type B to mini to micro, with something a bit more like the tiny and highly capable type C, if indeed we do continue to use cables in this way and don't go entirely wireless. But despite USB's present near dominance of this space, history has shown that there will always be alternative views as to which is the proper, most ideal way to do anything. And powering our devices and allowing our devices to talk to each other is no different in this regard. Right now, it is a relatively simple matter to, for instance, help my smartphone talk to my laptop. Even without plugging them into each other, I can do it wirelessly. But what if I come into possession of an older device that lacks modern wireless technologies and uses a wildly outdated, no longer supported charging and data transfer convention? Or what if other competing conventions come along, like the Lightning Connector, which is proprietary to Apple? They developed it and they own the standard. They designed it to replace the much wider 30-pin connector that was on their older model iPods and iPhones. And today, the lightning connector exists awkwardly alongside the USB-C standard. Their laptops using the USB-C and their phones using lightning. What if something like that comes along and replaces or even partially replaces the USB standard? How interoperable would our devices be if there wasn't just one or just a few connection frameworks through which everything could connect to everything else. Considering that older USB cables, depending on the brand in which connection standard we're talking about, will usually last for between 1,500 and 5,000 plug and unplug cycles. The newer USB-C cables have a minimum rating of 10,000 of these cycles. But all the same, these cables, especially the area around the ends of the cable, they will wear out eventually, and the cable will become useless. If another standard replaces this one, something like Firewire or Lightning, or something brand new, something that is not from this USB family of connectors, and then, consequently, companies no longer make USB cables of the proper fit with the proper connector on them, and most or all of the old ones that would fit are destroyed from use, what then? What happens to all the data on these suddenly inaccessible devices? What happens to the devices themselves, which may still have some life in them, but which can no longer function within the modern media ecosystem because they can't connect to any of our other devices? What I want to talk about today connects, no pun intended, to this topic in that it deals with some as of yet undealt with consequences of the digital age. Specifically, how do we archive information when it ceases to have a physical manifestation? And what do we do when our storage mediums evolve? Or, if tech gods forbid, something were to happen to the storage mediums upon which we've come to rely so completely? <music> You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. If you are enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron. You can go to patreon.com slash let's know things and contribute however much you like, whatever makes sense to you and your financial situation. Any amount is appreciated and gets you access to a small assortment of additional content and other such goodies. Also super helpful is leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And you might also consider purchasing one of my books if you are into that sort of thing. You can find a complete list of those over at colin.io. A huge thanks to everyone who's already contributed in some way. That means a whole lot. Thank you very much. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I want to start with today comes from PC Gamer, and it's entitled Experimental 5D Data Storage Could Store 360 Terabytes of Games for 
billion years. This article is actually just one of many on this topic that I considered unspooling as an introduction to this concept, but I felt that this one was optimal as, first, it comes from a fairly geeky source, and second, it attempts to put into broader context a new storage medium that I felt lacking that additional context might at first seem a little bit strange and confusing and even unnecessary. The storage medium in question is what's being called, in some reports, the Superman Memory Crystal because of its resemblance to the memory crystals used in the old-school Superman movies. But the more correct name for this medium is 5D Optical Data Storage, though there's also a semi-branded version of this technology called the 5D Memory Crystal. And what this medium is, really, is kind of an advanced CD or hard drive. You can use it to store information. And it's remarkable because it can store a whole hell of a lot of information. The biggest solid state hard drive available today, as I record this in March of 2018, is a 30 terabyte, two and a half inch drive unveiled by Samsung last month. There have been bigger demonstration style drives, meaning drives that were never made available for sale and which have a far larger form factor, so they wouldn't fit into a laptop, much less a smartphone. But 30 terabytes takes the cake when it comes to commercially available hardware for storing data without moving parts. And having no moving parts is important, as that's what allows these hard drives to be safely included inside of modern laptops and smartphones and other devices. If you use the older magnetic spindle method of storing data, like what you find in these older hard drives, you introduce not just bulk and noise, but also more points of failure to the data storage process, which just is not commercially feasible in today's technology. This new tech, though, this 5D optical storage medium, is solid state, but rather than being predicated on computer chips storing data by using integrated circuit assemblies, as is the case with the solid state drives that are on the market today, this new technology stores information on nanostructured glass using a femtosecond laser writing process, which is also called a mode locking process, which means the storage medium is essentially a piece of glass that has a design embedded inside it at the nanoscale. And that design is inscribed there using a laser that fires extremely short, extremely accurate bursts, which means that they're not just small. They're also able to create incredibly precise cavities inside the glass at a precise location, but also of a precise size. There are a lot of other interesting technical details related to this technology, and I will share links to that information in the show notes. But one other thing that's important to note here is that the quote-unquote glass that's used is actually a non-photosensitive, highly stable, high-resiliency material. And most often right now, what they're using is fused quartz. So although it looks like glass, it's actually super durable, able to survive fires and temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees Celsius, which is over 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, and it can survive impacts of up to half a ton. Further, because of those internal designs, which create kind of a lattice or framework that's called a nanograding, information can be printed inside this glass across five dimensions, not just two or three. One dimension is the nanostructure's orientation. One is the strength of the light that it refracts, which is why it's important to have a very precise, very quick laser. And then you have the data's location based on the standard X, Y, and Z three-dimensional axis. The end result of all of this tech wizardry is a little glass-looking disc of about 12 to 25 millimeters, or a little under half an inch to a little under an inch in diameter. And though they are experimenting with different thicknesses, it's estimated that at those diameters, and with the thickness of a CD, about 1.2 millimeters, or about 1 20th of an inch, 
they should be able to store 360 terabytes of data per disk and have that information remain safe and readable for billions of years. Or to quote a piece that was published about this technology on the International Society for Optics and Photonics website back in 2016, quote, even at elevated temperatures of 462 Kelvin, the extrapolated decay time is comparable to the age of the universe, 13.8 billion years. Based on the tests, we believe that these copies could survive the human race, end quote. 462 Kelvin is about 189 degrees Celsius, or 372 degrees Fahrenheit. So basically, even at very high temperatures, these disks should be able to last just under 14 billion years, which is a whole lot longer than a CD at any temperature, in my experience. I've had CDs that ceased working after just a few years at normal room temperature, not to mention the fact that most CDs max out at about 700 megabytes of storage, while these 5D glass disks would hold about 514,000 times that much data. So as storage mediums go, this would be quite the upgrade. These 5D optical disks were first theorized and then experimentally demonstrated in 1996, the same year that the USB port was introduced. And both reading and writing onto the disks using a more modern version of the femtolaser technique that I mentioned a moment ago was first demonstrated at Kyoto University in 2010. Considering the potential power of these things, of this storage medium, remarkably little has been done with them thus far. Only a handful of finished discs have been produced and utilized in any meaningful way. There's one that contains the King James Bible, another that contains the Magna Carta, another that is inscribed with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, yet another has Newton's work, optics, lasered into it. The most famous of these discs, though, are probably the first two that were produced using modern methods, and which were given to the Tesla and SpaceX founder, Elon Musk, who keeps one of them in his private collection, while the other was launched into heliocentric orbit aboard his Tesla Roadster recently, which itself was launched into space aboard a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. The 5D disc aboard the so-called Starman Roadster contains, fittingly, Isaac Asimov's Complete Foundation series, which, if you're not familiar with it, is a fairly epic story that tells the tale of a human galactic empire that is collapsing from its height of culture, kind of like Rome did back in the day. And a mathematician predicts this fall early on and builds a giant library on a tiny planet way out in the middle of nowhere on the outskirts of human civilization so that humanity can rebuild using the knowledge stored in this library. After everything goes down and civilization collapses, everything that they've discovered and done will be preserved. This is fitting because one of the main developers of this technology today is a non-profit called Arch Mission, which was founded to, quote, preserve and disseminate humanity's most important information across time and space for the benefit of future generations, end quote. It was this group that gifted these two disks to Elon Musk, and it's this group that's made the most concrete plans for this storage medium thus far. They are planning to store the most vital of human knowledge, a backup of human science and discovery and culture, and tuck it away into safe places around the solar system, storing that information lasered into these glass disks in orbit around every planet and eventually other celestial bodies like asteroids as well. So they're going to pepper the solar system with these tiny libraries of human culture. They also hope to build a permanent repository of information on the moon, and they hope to connect these space-based backup libraries to each other and to any humans who want to access them via a decentralized read-write data sharing wireless network that spans the solar system. This project, then, is meant to help establish a kind of Wikipedia of the future, but it's also a just-in-case measure, along the same lines as those 
remotely located seed vaults in Scandinavia, which have been built to help humans repopulate the planet with diverse life in case of a nuclear war or a natural cataclysm of some kind. Which are not nice things to think about, I know, but it is nice to know that someone is thinking about such things, just in case. But let's take a step back from that cheerful thread of inquiry and talk about encoded information. Every society that we've ever built as a species has been capable of communication. This generally means a collection of gestures, facial expressions, and sounds, which in most cases, for societies that lasted beyond ancient times, evolved into some kind of language. All of these mechanisms of communication allow us to transfer information to each other, whether that means pointing at where there's danger, or indicating where food can be found and how it can be eaten, or reciting epic poetry and having an argument about who said what insulting thing to whom. This model of information transference is fairly resilient because it's generally taught within one society and it becomes more useful the more it's used and the more fine-grained and specific it becomes. There's a survival and flourishing-based incentive to be a good communicator, so those who live today tend to be at least halfway decent at it, enough to get by anyway, and enough that we tend to pick up the fundamentals of these communication capabilities when we're children. Everything got more complex, though, around 5,000 years ago, when in Sumeria, a bunch of cultures in the region started documenting their transactions, and then, based on the marks that they were using to keep track of their trade goods, started documenting other things as well. The written language that emerged from this area, cuneiform, is one of the earliest forms of writing that we know about, and it went on to influence many other writing systems in the region. And it also informed, interestingly, the 60-second and 60-minute based timekeeping system used throughout the world today. The Sumerians used a numerical system based on 1, 10, and 60, and that organizational method was influential enough to last this many thousands of years into the future. So writing early on was already a pretty solid way to keep track of who owed whom how many goats. But what's perhaps most impressive and valuable about writing is that it allows for the transfer of information throughout time and space. You can orally tell stories and have them passed down through the generations, of course, but memory fades and information is miscommunicated, especially when it's based on a temporal in-person system of transfer. Writing something down, on the other hand, allows you to encode information and have it decoded on the other end, wherever that other end happens to be, geographically or throughout time. And as a result, so long as we know the code, the language in which this information was written, we can read the exact message that was written down by someone who lived thousands of years ago, or someone who lives contemporarily to us, but thousands of miles away. You can chisel words onto a stone tablet, or you can ink words onto a papyrus scroll. You can scribe words into a manuscript, or you can use movable type to print words into a book. You can type words into your computer, which are then converted into ones and zeros, and translated and retranslated into a variety of formats. Or you can laser etch words across multiple dimensions into a tiny glass disk and shoot them into space on a sports car or in tiny satellites orbiting other planets and asteroids throughout the solar system. Newer technologies often result in higher fidelity that is truer to the original intent, the original message, translations of what was written down and stored. Using a USB thumb drive, you can store a great deal more and higher resolution information than you could have inscribed onto a papyrus scroll. You can embed higher resolution video interactive tutorials, music, and millions of pages of text onto a piece of flash memory no bigger than your thumbnail. And as long as you have a machine capable of reading it on the other end, something into which you can plug that USB drive and read and present its contents, you're in good shape. The paradox of storage mediums, though, is that as they become more complex and less fragile in many ways, these 5D optical glass discs can survive far more punishment than a papyrus scroll, for instance. 
but they also at the same time become more fragile in that accessing and utilizing them requires higher and higher levels of technological sophistication and specificity. So while a papyrus scroll might easily burn up in a fire or be reduced to dust by time and sunlight, if you know the right language, you can still read a papyrus scroll if it hasn't yet degraded. A 5D optical glass disc, however, requires sophisticated, expensive machinery that only just recently became available. There are only a few people alive today who would be capable of reading that copy of Asimov's Foundation series that's embedded on that little disc in the Tesla Roadster out in space right now. And this disc was launched ostensibly to preserve that data, or to demonstrate a good way of preserving data. And yet it is unreadable by the vast majority of the human population. The paradox, then, is a bit like comparing the pyramids of Giza to a modern skyscraper. Yes, by almost every single possible metric, the skyscraper is a vastly superior building. But in terms of expected lifespan, the pyramids have outshone every modern building we've ever produced. They are rugged as hell. They have had an epic lifespan. Just like the pyramids, then, that papyrus scroll has this one advantage over the in every other way superior 5D storage disk. Papyrus may not be the best possible storage medium, but if everything goes sideways and civilization falls, we have a far better chance of rediscovering and utilizing the information on those scrolls, or even just written down on paper somewhere, anywhere, than we do information stored on glass disks in space that require complex technology to even recognize them as storage mediums, much less locate them and access them. I wanted to talk about the USB standard in the intro because it connects to this topic at this juncture. It's a technology that's wonderful and valuable, but which in a way also complicates the matter of storage and transferring information. And if USB were to disappear, which based on historical precedent, it almost certainly will at some point, that creates a lot of complications for information that is currently stored on devices and hard drives that require the USB standard to access. And a similar problem is present with the storage media to which these ports, USB or otherwise, connect. It may be that we are able to plug into a USB-based drive only to find that the media to which it grants access does not play well with whatever newfangled storage medium we develop in the future. Maybe the whole theory, the ones and zeros thing, changes at some point. Maybe the superposition component of quantum computing changes that, which makes all information currently stored in computers and other digital devices using that traditional mechanism of computer storage inaccessible or in need of some kind of dramatic conversion. Maybe we move on to something new that is so much better than our current computing theory that everything we've done up to this point is laughably outdated to a degree that we cannot even begin to come up with a method of converting the old to the new. Or maybe something else happens. Maybe a series of EMPs, electromagnetic pulses, destroy many of our largest information storage facilities, wiping significant portions of all human knowledge from existence in an instant. Maybe a massive solar flare scores a direct hit on the planet, which is something that has happened before, by the way, though thankfully it happened in a pre-electronics age. But maybe it happens this time during our current information age and causes a similar disruption, scouring clean the hard drives that we've come to rely upon and which we've come to trust. Or it may be that we throw our collective lots in with some new technology, a multi-dimensional glass disk, for instance, only to find later, too late, maybe a decade after switching all of our information over to this new medium, that the technology is not all it was claimed to be. Maybe instead of lasting billions of years, some unforeseen variable causes these storage mediums to degrade after only 10 or 20 years. Suddenly all of that information that we have moved over, that we have stored in these purportedly nearly immortal, reliable mediums, these drives, is gone. And because we've been making the slow shift toward fewer hard copies, less printed paper, more digital everything. There are no backups. 
that are not also contained on this flawed medium. Whole chunks of our history, of our collective hard-fought and won knowledge and culture, could disappear, could degrade out of existence before we even realize what's happening. Or maybe after we realize what's happening, but the words fade before our eyes as we attempt to make a last-ditch effort to print out massive new tomes, new physical encyclopedias, knowing all the while that there's no way there's enough paper on the planet to contain all the words that we've written, much less a similar means of containing all of the music and film and images and other works that we have produced in the digital age stored and accessed completely non-tangibly. Something like this is a real enough possibility that it even has a name, the digital dark age. And beyond the possibilities that I just outlined, there's one more way that it could happen that is considered by many to be the real, true, most likely possibility here, though it's also substantially less dramatic and summer movie worthy. It could be, at some point in the future, that we look back at this moment in history, the electronics age, through the information age up till whatever comes next, and we can't figure out what happened during this period. We have artifacts from before, of course, all that paper, all those physical goods, but from the perspective of far future humans, it might look like nothing much happened from World War II until, let's say, the middle of the 21st century much of our effort began to go into producing digital goods, digital-first companies, works of art that are predicated solely on digital mediums. And just as we look back now at the European early Middle Ages, the period right after the decline and fall of Rome, the time period that we refer to sometimes as the Dark Ages, this moment in time we're living in too, might someday gain a similar moniker. It might be considered a digital dark age. And just like that historical previous dark age, the term would not be correct. A lot happened back then. It's just that we do not have much physical evidence of it because of a shift in cultural priorities. And they put relatively less focus on sculpture and other long-lasting artifacts. We had Rome, which presented us with gobs of evidence, physical, long-lasting evidence of their existence, stuff that has lasted until today. But then we have this period that offers up much less that was made in mediums that could survive for that long. So the Dark Age moniker is not an accurate label for that period of time. Stuff was happening, but it is an indication that less of what happened was produced in mediums that could survive through the ages, for archaeologists to later unearth and document. The downside of what we are doing now with our digital mediums could be similar. We could be living through a period of human history that offers up very little to the future because of the technologies upon which we have come to depend. And that could cause the continuity, the perceived continuity, of the human record and human culture to be broken. Those are the broad strokes of the concept of a digital dark age anyway. There's also concern about the effects of time and environment on many common mediums we've used in the past, like magnetic tape, alongside the threats posed by proprietary and obsolete file formats, encoding methods that are owned by corporate entities, essentially, and file formats that disappeared shortly after being produced and utilized for a time, a great deal of computing history has already been lost or made inaccessible due to these two issues. So these are not entirely empty concerns. There's also increasing concern within the engineering world about the change up in how computer components are being used today. On semiengineering.com, a website about semiconductors. There was a recent piece about how computer chip aging is being accelerated as computer hardware developed for traditional computing use cases, basically chips being used inside of laptops or other computers, are now instead being used in devices like smartphones and Internet of Things devices and cars, all of which result in very different use cases with very different variables. The chips in most cars today, for instance, have to survive variable weather conditions, vibrations, and altitudes 
while chips in home security cameras need to be turned on continuously, operating at a low power level, 24-7. Many of the chips being used for these tasks are based on an architecture, though, that was developed for computers that were meant to be used maybe a handful of hours per day before being turned off overnight. And although the chips can survive these new use cases, there's evidence that the predicted lifespans, especially the useful, full capability lifespans of this hardware, will be substantially diminished as a result of these changes in how they are being used. Or said another way, in a world where there are computer chips in everything, and most of our data is backed up in remote places around the world, we are not sure how well these chips, or the storage media to which they're attached, will do over time. We have predictions, but this tech has not been around long enough for us to know for certain that it has the predicted amount of longevity. And because of how quickly we have transitioned over to these new mediums, these new storage mechanisms, these new file formats, this new everything, this potential degradation could at some point become a serious problem, a digital dark age scale problem. And I'm not the only person who is a little bit concerned about this. Worries over these and similar potentialities have already led to a number of efforts to preserve cross-sections of the early digital age, works that were created and stored on what are now considered to be outdated, sometimes difficult to convert file formats. The folks at the Video Game History Foundation, for instance, are attempting to find and archive materials related to video gaming, especially the early years of video gaming, in an accessible, referenceable format. What this means in practice is scanning game packaging and documentation, marketing, PR, and advertising materials, and even game reviews that were published contemporaneously in newspapers and on early websites. They also preserve the original binary code that made the game. They present it in a playable format, a format that is verified as being clean and virus and malware free, by the way, and they're even able to get and preserve and index internal documentation relevant to the development of the game. The original source code, the comments on that code, graphical assets, things of that nature. All of this combined, it's thought, will help us look back, today and further in the future, on the early days of video games to see where it all came from, how it started, how it grew into whatever it is that it will someday become. Some of these resources, unfortunately, have already been lost or are buried so deep in some old, derelict, barely functioning or non-functioning computer that's sitting in a scrap heap somewhere, that they may as well be lost. But the folks behind this foundation are trying to do this archiving now so that they can get at as many of these assets as possible and store them in what they hope will be more long-lasting mediums before they completely disappear into the ether, into the scrap heap of history. There was an announcement for another similar, though more specific, effort the other day as well. This one is orchestrated as part of the larger Internet Archive project, and is focused on preserving old-school handheld gaming devices. Now, this may be a tricky thing to picture if you did not grow up in the 80s or 90s, but back in the day, before sophisticated gaming systems like Game Boys, there were self-contained plastic games that were digital, but incredibly simple, with a finite number of graphics that could be displayed. And all of it was displayed in black and white, but there was a huge variety of these things. There were MC Hammer games, Sonic the Hedgehog games, Donkey Kong and Tamagotchi and Mario and Mortal Kombat games. Basically, early handheld portable gaming was presented in this format. One game, one device, no cartridges. It wasn't a console. Each game was more like a toy that you would buy. But many of these games have been lost to history. The technology is just super old and outdated, and let's be honest, truly lame compared to modern video games. But these gaming units are also quite charming in a lot of ways. 
and they absolutely look like a product of that era. There are some pretty nice shapes and game system graphics that are adorning these handheld units, and they kind of almost look like little arcade cabinets that are meant to slip into a pocket on your dungarees. So the Internet Archive set up a special section of its site, archive.org, dedicated to these handheld gaming systems. And like the Video Game History Foundation's offerings, you can play these games in your browser and see just how far games have come and how lucky we are to have even the simplest of console games today compared to what some of us grew up with. That's valuable perspective. I will link to those resources and the home of the MAME, M-A-M-E, project as well, which is another group that has done a whole lot to preserve old video games, particularly older arcade games, which, if you use the MAME format, can be played on non-arcade cabinet devices. But it's important to note that it's not just games that are getting this treatment. Fans of media of all flavors are rushing to preserve the evidence of the early days of their craft, and they are fighting against time, really, to do it. In the world of film, for instance, we know that more silent films have been lost than still survive today. We have documentation of these films' existence, but the original films themselves were either not preserved, because they legally didn't have to be for most of history, which is a significant part of why the Library of Congress estimates that 75% of all silent films have been lost, but it's also because of the type of film medium that was used back in the day. Up until 1952, the film that you shot movies on was highly flammable. It would sometimes spontaneously combust. And on top of that, the perception of many of these films by most people was that they were valueless, really. They were a good way to make a buck, but beyond that, after they were out of theaters, why hold on to them? What's the point? And as a consequence, the Film Foundation, which was founded by Martin Scorsese with the purpose of preserving and archiving classic cinema, estimates that more than 90% of American films made before 1929 are lost. They're just gone forever. And on top of that, a series of early disasters like a fire that took place in a storage vault in 1937 destroyed all of Fox Films' original film negatives for work that was produced before 1935, and another fire took place in 1967, which led to the loss of hundreds of silent films and early films with sound as well. So there were several variables here, all of which led to a situation where these films were very hard to preserve. And now we look back at this moment, this period in film history, and we have very little to go on. It's its own niche, film-related dark age, in a way. You can perhaps understand, then, knowing that, why organizations like the Internet Archive would go to such great lengths to preserve early handheld video games. These things don't seem particularly important to us today, but who's to say what the video game industry will evolve into? And who's to say that these early handheld games won't be regarded with the same historical importance as those early silent films that we now so immensely regret losing, but treated as little more than garbage at the time? The Internet Archive is also investing its resources in other mediums. As of the day I'm recording this, its website, archive.org, contains 279 billion web pages, 11 million books and texts, 4 million audio recordings, including 160,000 live concert recordings, 3 million videos, including 1 million television news program recordings, 1 million images, and 100,000 pieces of software. They make this information available in multiple formats. One of the best-known access points for this data is probably the Wayback Machine, which uses their archive of websites to show what a particular site looked like on a particular date in history. So you can go back and see what that slice of online real estate looked like two or eight or ten years ago, if you like. They've been doing something similar for archival television footage for historic events, like the coverage of the events of September 11th, 2001. 
and all that coverage is searchable and indexable. Again, not because we know precisely why or how or if this information will be useful, but because it could be at some point. And it's a good idea if we have the capability to lock down these pieces of history and index them and present them in accessible ways whenever we are able. Now, these are notable but still incomplete efforts. The Internet Archive only started archiving television programming from the year 2000 onward, for instance. So everything from before that, though some of it is available in chunks in multiple places, it's not easily searchable by anyone who might want to find a particular subject being referenced throughout the history of TV, or for anyone who wants to find all footage from a specific date sometime in 1972. Storing all of television programming, of course, would be, and is, as far as we're doing it now at least, quite the undertaking. The more we make, the more space it requires. And the more our technologies evolve, the higher the resolution of our videos, the larger the files, which then, in turn, requires even more space. We're also seeing an immense increase in the amount of media produced each year due to smartphones and the mobile internet and social networks, all of which encourage the production of digital stuff, of videos, of photos, of posts, of tweets, of GIFs. It all adds up, and storing it is an undertaking, and storing it in a useful, indexable way is even more of an undertaking. Storing it in a way that can never be lost is not something that we can quite promise yet, but the redundancy efforts that we've already undertaken in an attempt to make these things immortal and always accessible, takes up even more space. It increases the overall amount of space that we're using for this media many fold. And we do all of this knowing the whole time that we cannot possibly catch every single thing that's created. And knowing that a huge percentage of what we save, what we commemorate for all time, will be useless. It will be nonsense. It will be accidental tweets and videos that only show somebody's finger over the lens of their smartphone. And at the same time, as we are commemorating and saving and immortalizing this useless junk, work of valuable historical significance is falling through the cracks. Or in some cases, that work will exist forever in perpetuity in a single smartphone's hard drive, but will never be made available anywhere else like a library book that has been misshelved in a part of the building that no one ever visits or ever will visit again. This is information and media that might be useful, might be the most important thing in the world to someone, and which exists and continues to exist, but which is nonetheless useless because it is not archived and indexed and made accessible. It's not presented in a useful way. Which leads me to one final potentially very big concern that could become even bigger, depending on what happens in the next decade or so. There's a chance that a great deal of what's being created today, the important and the unimportant stuff, could be owned, or owned for all intents and purposes, by a single corporation, or a couple big corporations. Think Facebook, think Google, think Amazon, think all of the big companies that encourage us to create stuff and to store our work on their servers, within their cloud services. These companies could either stand between us and our work in some legal way, maybe just keeping access to anything that is stored on their systems from being archived out in the world with everything else on these accessible indexes, and perhaps they decide to make a business decision of it and eventually start charging people to access this stuff that arguably should be available to everyone, no matter what. Or they could, and I think that this is frighteningly possible, actually, these companies could go out of business or experience a major cyber attack or find themselves, for some reason, no longer able to maintain and upkeep and index all of this content, all of this data with which they have been entrusted. At which point... It's kind of like a major movie company either misplacing the key to or setting fire to their film vault. We lose access to most or all of that stuff, work that we assumed was being archived and indexed, but which was instead just being hoarded and eventually was, for all practical purposes, lost. 
So as we look at these entities, which provide us with so many valuable things, and that scope includes companies that are making games and films, but also those that encourage us to make and publish and share our own, as we consider what they're offering, it's worth sparing a thought to wonder just how trustworthy their vaults might be. How our information with them and beyond, anywhere we happen to store information, how it is being stored, how it is being archived, how it is being indexed and made accessible, what type of longevity the hardware and software involved might realistically present us with, and what we might do personally and civilizationally if everything were to go sideways, either because of a solar flare or an impressive upgrade in our technological storage capabilities. If the USB were to disappear, how would we preserve what we've created on USB accessible devices? If current solid state hard drive technologies were to disappear, how would we smoothly transition to whatever comes next? If today's modes of communication and the encoding of information were to radically shift in some way, how might we preserve everything that we have learned and shared using today's methods? And how do we create backups and safeguards without at the same time risking clinging to a flawed, perhaps unnecessary collection of antique ephemera? How do we enjoy the benefits of digitizing things in a way that makes them useful both today and in a potential future without becoming a civilization of digital hoarders? How do we find that balance point and how do we identify what will be the silent films that we wish still existed and what will be the YouTube video with the thumb over the smartphone lens? How can we accurately assess the value of artifacts that we are creating today that might only become valuable because of what they tell the future about who we are now. If you are enjoying this podcast, consider taking a moment to leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're keen to contribute monetarily, that's wonderful as well. There are multiple different options. You can use PayPal or Venmo or cash.me. And there are instructions on how to do that at letsnotethings.com. But you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash letsnotethings. Instead of recommending a book today, I'd like to recommend a documentary or a documentary series, actually, that I watched recently and really enjoyed. It's called Wild Wild Country, and I watched it on Netflix here in the U.S. I'm sure it's available via other mediums elsewhere, but it's definitely on Netflix if you are in the U.S. And this is a documentary series. I think it was maybe six episodes, each one of them the length of a short traditional feature film documentary. And it tells the story of a guru from India and his, what most people would call a cult that did very, very well in India and then went to the United States. And it tells the story in a really interesting way because at first you kind of look at it and say, oh man, this group, the locals in Oregon, where they set up shop, they're just being xenophobic and they're being prejudiced because these people are from another country and because they're not Christian and because they are kind of a sex cult among other things and that doesn't jive with their traditional rural Oregonian values. But then you very quickly begin to understand that it's not such a black and white story. And in fact, this guru who later took the name Osho, you might recognize his name. Some of his quotes are passed around the internet. He was also taking all the money of his followers and buying himself Rolls Royces, and his second-in-command was instigating what we would definitely today call terrorist acts, poisoning and killing and like trying to assassinate public officials. They were very cleverly taking over first a ranch and then a town and then trying to take over a region, eventually trying to take over the entire state. And it was remarkable watching all of this with tons of archival footage, but also narrated by people on both sides of this conflict, people who ran this cult and participated in this cult and continue to participate in some cases today, but also the people who were being ousted from their small town in Oregon when all this was going down. 
So it was very fair, but it also did a very good job of illustrating how quickly a group that had a fairly fundamentally decent message, I thought, can turn into a semi-automatic weapon toting, poisoning the local salad bars to try to win elections kind of death cult. And I actually saw a really great review of this. I think it was in Vulture, and I want to quote that here because I think it describes some of the craziness pretty succinctly without giving too much away. Quote, it is a story that involves religion, free love, land use disputes, one of the co-founders of Nike, an exalted guru, abuse of power, arson, the wife of one of the producers of The Godfather, attempted murder, mass poisoning, an obsession with Rolls Royces, the homeless, election battles, and one extremely bizarre anecdote about attempting to contaminate a town's water supply using blended beaver parts, end quote. That sums up this story pretty well, I think. It's all very well produced. It's a story well told. It's a fascinating story. It's also more than a little bit disturbing, especially if you've seen all those Osho quotes floating around. This might add some additional context to those quotes. The series, again, was called Wild Wild Country. I watched it on Netflix. You might be able to find it elsewhere as well. But I highly recommend checking it out if that kind of thing sounds interesting to you. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my blog at xllifestyle.com. You can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at letsnotethings.com. Feel free to reach out and say hello on the social networks. I am at Colin is my name on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube. Thank you so much for listening. I am Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.